Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Wednesday lunchtime. I'm excited to talk all about summer gardening today. And I know it's different wherever you live. I know for here, um, I am in zone seven in Oklahoma City, and it is actually just starting to get into the warm parts. It has taken a while to take off. So we've been really lucky and gotten lots and lots of rain, and um, which is a great thing and also not so great thing for some of our plants. But for the most part, it has been amazing. And we are looking to be getting a lot warmer weather here coming up this week. So a lot of the things we'll be talking about will apply to when your temperatures are going to get higher or if they're going to stay mellow. We'll talk a little bit more about mild summers. We'll talk all about all different types of summers today. So I would love to see um, where everybody is from. If you guys can hop into the chat, say hi to everybody and let us know where you are, what zone you're in or where, what city, state, wherever. And we'd love to get to know you all and see where everybody is joining us from today. It's always fun because we always have a quite the variety because I'm in the center of the country and we usually have somebody from pretty much everywhere. So it's always fun to have a bunch of different people joining us. Okay. So uh, one thing I do want to make sure that I mentioned before I go any further is to make sure that you stay tuned to the very end of the presentation because we're going to be doing a giveaway for one of the lucky people who are here today to get a one year free premium app subscription for From Seed to Spoon. So it'll be awesome. Um, so if you haven't downloaded our From Seed to Spoon app yet, make sure that you do. It will help guide you through growing over 100 different fruits, vegetables, herbs, and it'll help guide you through like when to grow and how to grow, all of that. And I love it. I'm seeing all sorts of different people popping up in the chat all sorts of people from Michigan, Canada, Orlando. Ooh, I bet it is hot there. Northern Arizona, that's great. That's actually where I am originally from is Northern Arizona as well. But I'm currently in Oklahoma right here. So great. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about summer gardening. So let's get started. So first of all, I want to make sure that we know to choose the right plants. And that is one of the biggest things I hear because a lot of times people, whenever you're first starting out as well, like I know us too, whenever you're beginner gardeners, you don't necessarily know what are warm season crops, what are cool season ones. So there's a really easy way to, to check it out. So on the app, there's a filter for warm season. So if you click into that filter, it'll you can just hit warm and it'll pull up every single warm season crop that we have there too. And there's also a filter too that you can use that is a can be planted now. So that'll help guide you through. Um, it'll pull your current location and it'll say if you can plant it right now or not. Um, so that'll help narrow down the list of fruits and vegetables and herbs, all of that um, down to what you can or cannot grow at that time. So we're going to jump into a few specific ones that are known specifically for growing in the warm season. And I feel like the very first one that people always think about when growing food in the summer is going to be tomatoes. So whether that be bush tomatoes or vining tomatoes or tomatillos, all of those are great. Those are all really fantastic summer plants that thrive in the warm temperatures. Now, once the temperatures do get like too hot, so if they are like upper 90s, 100s even, they're not going to be producing a lot of fruit for you during that time, but they'll still be, they will still do great. They'll still thrive. But then once the temperatures come back down, you'll start to see more fruit development come in. So you may not just get a lot of, um, lots of harvest from them during these warm peaks if it gets too hot. But trust me, it will do just fine and will cover just fine if you take care of it. One of the biggest things that you will deal with when starting 
tomatoes and growing tomatoes is going to be that tomato hornworm. And I put a picture of it up there just to show the size of it. It is humongous. And you would be so surprised by how such a huge, huge caterpillar can blend in on a tomato plant. It is incredible. Um, so they can do damage really, really fast. They will eat and go through all of your foliage on your tomato plants. So you want to make sure that you're staying on top of that and watching out for these guys. And if you do happen to see on the bottom picture right there, I have a picture of the caterpillar with the little white eggs on it. If you see that, that's a great thing. And you want to keep it there because those are wasp eggs. So by the time you see that, that caterpillar is not going to be doing any more damage, but you can have the wasp that is helping you out in the garden, go through and um, hatch more babies to help you in the garden. And I know people get terrified thinking, oh no, I don't want any wasps in the garden. That was how I was too in the very beginning, but you learn to love the insects and all of that out there that can really help you, especially those wasps. And they're pretty solitary. They don't really mess with you at all. They don't really care at all. Um, I've never gotten stung out there and we have lots and lots of them, um, which is a great thing. I love having them around because they can help with so many different critters and pests in the garden. So I, whenever I see a tomato hornworm with those on them, I cheer a little bit. I get excited. <laughs> Um, and one way to go about just deterring all of this is some companion planting. So up there, I have a picture of the tomatoes with the marigolds planted next to them. And marigolds are an amazing companion plant for tomatoes. I feel like um, the two biggest um, companions that I think of whenever I think of tomatoes are going to be the marigolds. Well, marigolds and nasturtiums, they're both really great. And then basil as well. Those are fantastic companions. They do different things. And sometimes I like doing a tomato plant with basil and a flower, like the marigold or nasturtium, and have all of them together and growing together. They work fantastic. So now that I've mentioned basil, let's talk a little bit about basil. <clears throat> so basil is another one of my favorite things to grow and not just for its benefits for tomatoes and for lots of different plants um, it is an amazing companion plant helps repel lots of different pests as well as improve the, like the flavors of tomatoes and things like that um, they just they grow really well um, and they thrive in the heat they absolutely love the temperatures and um they're one that you, it grows really fast, so you can get a fast harvest from them, and you can use them really fast in the kitchen. I love having basil, um, basil pesto with, with them. It's really good and really tasty, and um, you can add it into like sauces and things like that. Um, the biggest thing that you want to upkeep with basil, um, and I have a picture of it right here, is when you see those little flowers coming up on the top, Whenever you see those, you just want to make sure that you pinch those gently and pull them off because it means that it's trying to go to seed and you want to try and prevent that from happening. It'll also help to have a bushier basil plant too, and it'll encourage more growth as you go through. So I always do that. And then at the end of the season, I'll go ahead and let it flower and bloom. And it's super pretty. It brings in a lot of beneficials as well. And then you, you can save the seeds from them works out great. And then up on the very top, you can see how much basil harvest we got one year. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, we had so much. You can just go through and trim like a little bit at a time. Or if you have like a freeze coming in, basil's not going to last through that at the end of the season. So we just go through and cut it all off. And we can go through and preserve it either, again, by making pesto or there's other things that we do for um, preserving with basil. You can dry it, or you can also put them in like these ice cube trays and put some oil in with like chopped up basil or whatever it is that you wanna use. And then once it freezes, you can pull those out and you can just store them in your freezer and then you can pull them out and use them whenever you wanna do some 
a sauce or anything like that. And it makes it a lot easier to cook with. And then peppers. I wanted to make sure I talked about peppers because those ones are definitely another one that everybody always thinks about in the summer. And I have hot peppers on here, but this all of this applies to hot peppers, sweet peppers, banana, bell, all of that. And these are all really good ones. And we honestly grow lots and lots and lots of peppers out here. We love it. We have fun just growing a different variety of them, different colors, different flavors, because they're all so unique. And there are so many countless ways you can um, use them, preserve them, all of that. So one of the biggest things I want to mention, because um, whenever you go about transplanting your peppers out, you want to make sure that the temperatures are right for them or else you're going to have stunted peppers. And this goes for the uh, tomatoes as well. Um, pretty much any, any of these warm season crops. You wanna make sure that the temperatures are great for them. And for us here in zone seven, we've had our, our peppers out now for several weeks. Um, but I mean, we kind of just look at the temperatures and see how things are gonna go. <clears throat> you wanna make sure that the temperatures are in, usually we look at the upper 40s to 50s for the low. So nothing below that and then we can transplant them out. Now, sometimes I know, especially up north, it's a little difficult to find times when the temperatures are appropriate for that. Um, <clears throat> so some things you can do, I have some pictures up here that we've done in the past is by having, we have a do-it-yourself hoop house that we've built that we put over top of the plants. So it'll help keep it just a little bit warmer um, so that way it can protect it if your temperatures are going to be a little iffy, it's still in the 40s, but you want to go ahead and transplant them out there. You can do that. Or if you have like a sudden fast freeze coming up that you didn't know about and your plants are already out there, as long as you get, get them covered, typically they'll be okay. But you want to make sure that you do something because you want to make sure that they don't get stunted because if they do get stunted from the cold weather, it's, it's really difficult to get them back if you can get them back. Um, another thing that we do is do these gallon size jugs right here, um, or these five gallon jugs. We just cut the bottom off of it and put it over top of the plant. So we can do this to help create like a little mini greenhouse. If there's like just a specific plant that we want to protect, or um, if there's like a storm coming in, you can protect from hail even. So um, one year we had like a really bad hailstorm coming in. So we went through and put several of these over top of our favorite plants we wanted to protect and it, it definitely helped. So just anything you can do to help protect them throughout the transition time, getting them out into the garden will be the best. And I absolutely love preserving peppers. Like I said, we grow a whole bunch of peppers. And one easy thing that we do to preserve them, so easy, we just go through and I chop off the top and pop them into a, like a ninja blender or something along those lines and um, get them into small pieces. Like you can see up here, um, right above me actually, in that picture. Um, I go through and chop them up into a whole bunch of little pieces through the blender and then lay them out flat put them in the freezer for a day and then pull them out. And then you could just put them in a freezer safe baggie and they're good for at least a year. Um, I've done this like pretty much every year since we first started gardening and uh, it's, it's amazing. I use it all the time. It's great because then we can always pretty much have peppers even in the winter time. So it's great. We had one year where we literally had probably like, 10 bags in the freezer we were giving it away to neighbors and family because we just had so many peppers preserved it was it was a great problem to have i love it that's one i always want um one other thing we've done too um over here we have a picture of our um just dried peppers pepper flakes that we've made um and we can do that again in many different ways by either dehydrating them or um, drying them 
And then again, just running them through a blender and getting them finely shredded up and put them into just a little container. I usually just put them into a mason jar when it's like that and put it up in our cupboard and pull it out whenever we are um, eating any sort of dish that I want to add a spice to. Or typically my husband will pull this out because um, he likes his stuff a lot spicier than the kids and I do. So he usually pulls that out and, start, and puts a lot of that on there. So it's, it's great to have around and it's a great way to preserve your peppers. So that way you can pretty much have peppers in your diet, like all winter long, even when you don't have fresh ones coming out. So it's great. So next on the list, we have another one of my favorites. If we can move to the next slide. Um, so on here, I wanted to make sure that I hit flowers, which so pretty much any type of flower, um, I have sunflowers up here and then, um, zinnias are another one of my favorites too, that I just love growing in the summertime and really any sort of flower like marigolds, nasturtiums, sunflowers, and um, the zinnias, like I said, cosmos, so many of these are going to be great to direct seed. You can grow them um, by direct seed or transplants pretty much the entire summer, which is amazing. And they will help to bring in a lot of different beneficials to your garden. Like these butterflies right here are great. And um, like in your garden and bumblebees and all of that. And the great thing about the zinnias that we have is... It, they direct seed themselves too. So you can plant it one year and I let them go to seed and drop all their seeds down below. And then every spring they come back up. It's amazing. I love it too. The, the sunflowers do the same thing too. So we always have like volunteer flowers pretty much everywhere. So it's pretty much just our wildflower patch that we have now. And it just a bunch of different beautiful flowers, brings in lots of different pollinators and all of that. Absolutely love them. So those are definitely things that you can grow most all summer long, no matter where you live. And then of course we needed to touch on some squash. Um, and I focused in on my favorite type of squash, which is the zucchini. Uh, it is probably one of my favorite things to grow just because I absolutely love eating zucchini. There's so many amazing recipes that you can do with them and so many unique ways to eat it. Um, but I did want to touch upon a few of the issues that you may have when growing zucchini over the summer. Um, and then the very first picture that I have up here is a, what we call a zucchini baseball bat. Um, which I feel like this happens. It's going to happen pretty much to everybody. And it happens to us every single season, regardless of how often we go out there. There's always a zucchini that is like hiding somewhere off to the side. Or if you forget one day and you go out the next day and look, the, the zucchini that was regular size that you're like, oh, I'll pull that here shortly. And then it's like this big the next day. Like they just, they explode and go so fast. But a lot of times people will say that they're not good to eat at that point. And um, for the most part, I mean, yes, you do want to harvest them when they are a lot smaller um, and it come up with a lot better. Um, it's a lot better to eat them. They just taste a lot better. But when they're the baseball bats like up there, you can still use them. They are still great. Um, what I typically do at this point is make what's called zucchini milk. And it's, it's not milk, but it, that's just what it's called. And um, pretty much you just blend the zucchini into a juice and you use that juice in replacement of recipes as milk pretty much. So um, I make like a homemade uh, bread and zucchini bread, things like that. And you can still use these in that as just a replacement for the butter. So it's or for it's the milk. So I absolutely love that. Um, some other things that you might see are some blossom end rot, which is that picture that's right above me. Um, and we actually have several that are struggling with this right now, um, because we have gotten 
so much rain in the garden, um, which again is great, but we do have some issues when we get too much rain, like getting blossom end rot on some of our plants. So um, these base, uh, these blossom end rots right here, um, pretty much at that point, there's nothing you can do. You just have to pull it. Um, and we, you can either compost it or if you have chickens or pigs like we do, we give them to them and they absolutely love them. But otherwise you can definitely compost it still. So it's not going to complete waste. But once you have the blossom and rot on a fruit, there's not really much you can do on that specific fruit except to try to fix the issue. And typically it is a watering issue. So the next fruits that you come that come up should hopefully be better if you fix your underlying issue of the blossom and rot. Um, other issues that you may see are pest issues with zucchini. So the squash vine borer and the squash bugs are, ugh, oh my gosh, they're my nemesis. But I put some pictures so that way you can see kind of what it is that you're dealing with. Um, that moth up there is what lays the egg um, at the base of your plant. And that's the squash vine borer moth. And it lays their eggs at the base of your plant. And then that caterpillar right there pretty much just eats your plant alive, like from the inside out. And ugh, it will turn a super healthy looking squash plant like dead in a day. Um, not completely dead, but it'll look extremely wilted. You'll, you'll know that there's an issue. And if you look at the base of the plant, you'll kind of see where it's like kind of coming apart. You can kind of see a little bit on the side of that one picture where it kind of looks nasty. Um, but there are a few things that you can do to help prevent things like that. If you've been having issues like putting aluminum foil around the base of the plants. Um, of course, companion planting is going to be great too. Um, um, but I actually, our last webinar that we had went over pest management and I went more into depth on each one of these pests and talked a lot about like methods of prevention and how to handle them if you see them, all of that. So if you missed that one, make sure you check it out because I go a little bit more in depth about these pest issues on that as well. And then the squash bugs, I did want to mention too because whenever I'm going out there in the summertime and I'm watering and checking in on my plants, I'm looking on the undersides of the leaves for those, um, for those eggs, or if there's like little baby squash bugs, because those are when you really want to try to catch it. If there's going to be an issue, you want to try and get them at that stage rather than letting them grow up to be adults, because otherwise they're going to be challenging to deal with. So you want to try and catch it early if you can. But I definitely love growing zucchini. I highly recommend it if you guys haven't tried it before to give it a try because, oh man, zucchini is amazing to eat from, from the garden. I love it. Oh, and it, so I do have a bunch of different recipes too. I think we posted a link to a bunch of recipes too. But under the app too, there's a section under that more tab. Um, if you go under zucchini and you go to more, there's a section for recipes and you can scroll through those too. And there's a bunch of different recipes there too. Okay, and then cucumbers are another one that are um, another plant that's great to grow over the summer. Now, cucumbers are gonna be one that you wanna make sure that you have some sort of trellis for them to climb up. A really easy thing that we do is just a cattle panel trellis. So we just pick up a cattle panel from um, a local farm and, farm and garden store, um, or you can do like um, hardware remesh um, from like a Home Depot Blows type of place. Um, anything you can do to just provide them some sort of trellis to climb up. Um, and then you can grow them up. They work really great. And the only issues that we typically have are the cucumber beetle and they can spread diseases. So you do wanna make sure that you handle them whenever you see an issue. Um, really easy things that you can do is just to, you can either make your own traps like we've done in the past that um, we did a do-it-yourself cucumber beetle trap. 
And it was um, super simple. We just did a, like a little stake in the ground and attached some yellow solo cups with some um, tangle, um, tangle trap glue on the inside. And um, so that way the, uh, the cucumber beetles got stuck on the inside of it. And then another thing you can always do is just these yellow sticky traps. Um, they're super simple, very easy to use. You just unstick the sides of it, hang it up. I, it's, it has never failed for us. So it always works really well. I love using those for the cucumber beetles whenever I have an issue. And then pole beans or bush beans, I wanted to touch on as well. So our method for growing beans, um, so we pretty much have beans growing, beans or peas growing at every stage of the time where we're gardening. So we start in the springtime with our peas and then we're gradually working our way um, once the temperatures start rising up to our pole beans and bush beans. And now uh, again, the pole beans, you wanna make sure that you have some sort of trellis for them. Um, actually, I have a picture of my favorite type of trellis that we do, which is a cattle panel arch trellis right there. So that is just made out of a cattle panel and it's arched over on itself and supported by T-posts on both sides and just zip tied onto the T-posts. So it works really well. And we grow, um, any sort of vining plant over top of it, but we did, we typically do like beans or something along those lines on them. And so this one was with beans. And so pole beans and bush beans grew, do, do really well. And then once it starts getting really hot, like in the heat of the summer, I do the, uh, the Southern peas, which is the black eyed peas. And those ones, thrive whenever it is super hot out. So we're again, so that way we are at least having some sort of replacement for our peas and beans in the heat of the summer. And then once the heat of the summer starts to die back again, we start growing some more be um, the pole beans and the bush beans. So we kind of have this method where we kind of go through stacks of planting and we do a lot of succession planting, especially with beans. Um, so that way we have a bunch of things uh, or a bunch of harvest all throughout the summer and they're all at different stages of life. And if something happens to one, we're good over here. So we like to do a lot of succession planting, especially with beans. And we're pretty much planting um, either the beans or southern peas or regular peas pretty much the entire time of our gardening. And beans are, again, super simple to preserve. And so you can't really grow too many because then you can just preserve them. And my favorite way to preserve them, probably the easiest way that I found at least, is by just simply freezing them. So what we've done before is just take a just take our beans and blanch them. Uh, so well, so you'll want to do a a quick boil and then put them into an ice bath and then dry them and put them in the freezer, safe bagging, put them in the freezer. So it just makes it super simple um, and they done really well for us in the past. And I really like them that way. And then a lot of people get really sad when, over the summer because they are out of their greens. Um, because at least for down in the South, you cannot really grow lettuce and spinach or kale, Swiss chard, things like that. Um, so for, for me, I know it's really sad because I love having all of those plants. Um, up North, you could probably get away with still growing quite a bit of those actually. Um, and they would still thrive, especially if you introduce some of the um, methods that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit about extending your growing seasons. Um, but there are some alternatives, too, for those of us who are living in the south and living in an area that is just a little too hot to be growing some of those other greens. And that is so there's a New Zealand spinach which is also called Tetragonia or Malabar spinach as well as another one that is a really good replacement. So those are all really good ones that you can actually grow over the summer. 
and can be a really good replacement for salads and things like that. They have a little bit different taste and texture, but again, it's a great replacement for your greens if you are missing those plants in the summer. And again, most of the only issues that you're going to see with these are going to be things like aphids. So um, I always use my ladybugs as a uh, as helpers. And I actually haven't had to introduce any ladybugs. We did um, at the very beginning, we introduced ladybugs because you can actually buy ladybugs, which is really cool. Uh, we did that the very first year. Um, and if you do go along that route and uh, make sure you release them at like dusk time and have plenty of like water around. So that way they have a food source and water source and they don't want to fly anywhere because it's about nighttime. So um, those are the tips that I'll give you. But um, here where we've been, we haven't introduced any ladybugs and they are just naturally attracted to it because we always have aphids for them to eat. So we, we just let the ladybugs handle the aphids and we don't have to do anything for it, which is great. Um, and so one thing I want to mention about ladybugs is that picture in the very top corner there is a picture of a baby ladybug, which we did not know that at all. Whenever we first saw it, the first time I saw that, I was like, what in the world is that? Cause it is super like, uh, super weird looking. So I, uh, I, I had to, had to look it up, had to Google it, but they're really good ones to, to have around. And they will also eat a lot of aphids and do really great things for you. Um, so you want to make sure that you are not harming those. If you see them, they're not a bad thing. They're a great thing to have in your garden. So you want to make sure that you are encouraging ladybugs in your garden. Um, other things that you may have issues with are things like slugs and snails. Um, We've had definitely our fair share of those out here in the garden. Um, but again, they are pretty fairly easy to manage. They can, um, they can be handled pretty easily by, um, I, what I do is these yellow little, um, little trays right here. I set those out next to a problem area and just put a little bit of like stale old beer, um, and in the bottom of it and then the slugs are, or snails are attracted to it. And then they'll go into that dish right there and they'll drown. So it'll be a lot, <laughs> they'll handle themselves pretty much. So it's a great way to handle, uh, handle the slugs and snails. And then next, if <laughs> we're gonna be talking, I think we have a couple more maybe left. And then we're going to talk a little bit about tips for summer gardening too. Okay. Okra. Yes. Okra might be our last one. Um, but okra definitely. So okra thrives in the heat of the summer. It is one that is great. And again, you want to make sure you're harvesting it when they are super small. Um, I mean, not super small, but like you see the size of these that I have up here, right here, you can see how small they are. They taste really great when they're about that size. And if you let them go, they will go, and you can see that picture in the top right where it is brown. Those ones right there are um, going to seed. So you can actually just leave those on the stalks, especially if it's at the end of the season, and just let them go to seed. And then you can pull that off right there and you have new seeds for okra on the inside, which is great. So we've accidentally done this before. And then also just like at the end of the season, we've just let a few of them go like that if, or if they get too big. Uh, we just kind of let that happen. So, but okra is a great, uh, one of our great things to grow. Oh, rosemary. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to make sure I touched a little bit on indoor growing because you can definitely still do indoor growing this time of year, um, especially doing things like um, propagating herbs. And I love propagating herbs, especially things like rosemary, because rosemary plants can be so expensive. And um, I love just making my own because then once I find a variety that I really like as well, I can just create like little clones of that plant. So I just go through and make like little cuttings of the rosemary plant. And then uh, I included a picture of the biodome on here too, because it is a really great and easy thing to use 
for propagating herbs. And um, it's definitely something that you want to um, want to look at and use because it'll be super helpful for you. It'll keep the humidity there in there for you and make watering really simple. Um, so whenever you're doing that, um, you'll all you need to do is just take a cutting, trim the bottom of it off, dip it in the, the take root that I have there. It'll help it at least. And then just dip it in um, to each one of those little holes. And you can have your own little rosemary plants growing. Um, I have a video that's all about how to how to propagate your own herbs. So make sure you check that out. It's it's real simple to use. Okay, so everybody always asks about watering. Um, um, well, before I say that, I do want to mention, so all of those plants were really great summer plants, but that is not the be all and end all of the list for sure. Those are probably just the key ones. Some of the more common ones that people always ask about or talk about. Um, so I want to make sure I touch base on a few of just the most common ones. Um, but I definitely want to touch base about watering too. Um, so watering is um, definitely something that can be difficult to keep up with in the heat of the summer because you don't really want to be out there that much, especially in the middle of the day. So we do a lot of watering in the morning. Um, and we've done several different ways of watering over the years. So up here at the, up here, I guess you can see where I'm pointing. Um, there's a PVC pipe drip irrigation that we've built there before. And we just built that by ourselves with, with some cutting uh, things that we've put together ourselves of PVC pipe. And we drilled little holes through it, attached a hose to it, ran the hose, and then water comes shooting out the sides. It worked fantastic. Works really great. Um, on a smaller level, um, I will say once we started getting into having like a whole bunch of different garden beds, it was not really time saving, but it still worked really well for us. But we would just have to go out there and, and move the uh, hose around. But this was really great, especially when we had just a few beds um, and it would work for one of our like four, you know, like four by eight size beds, too. Um, and it would work, work really well. Um, we have a video again that they put in the link about how to do that. Um, if you guys were interested in doing that, um, but you definitely don't have to go down that route and do something that intense. If you're wanting to go about watering. Um, I know everybody always talks about how horrible it is to overhead water, but honestly, like we do a lot of overhead water ourselves too. Um, just because we have such a wide variety or a wide space that we're using too. So you can definitely still use your, um, use sprinklers and things like that. The biggest things that I will say about the, um, about using that is to make sure to water in the morning. So if you're watering in the evening this way, it's not going to go as well because you're going to have damp plants overnight. Then you're going to have issues with possibly like um, you know, with the mold mildew growing. You know, you'll just have um, bad things happening <laughs> overnight. Um, so again, I always just water first thing in the morning and get that done with too. Um, another trick that we've learned too we grow a lot of plants in our smart pots, which are just these fabric raised beds. So they are absolutely amazing. You can see them up there in the little kiddie pool. And what we do up there, we have just a kiddie pool right there and a bunch of little smart pots in, in it. And then you can go through and just add some water into that kiddie pool. And then those smart pot containers will soak up the water from down below and will water itself throughout the day. So you can go out there, water your plants right before you go to work or in the morning. Um, and that way your plants will be soaking up all the water all throughout the day through the heat of the sun. Like it'll do a lot better for you. That was probably one of the biggest things that would save our, save us from having to spend so much time watering. Um, another tip I do want to make sure is 
that I hit is mulching. Um, this can absolutely help you um, both retain moisture in the soil as well as just keeping your plants just a little bit cooler as well. Um, so you would definitely be surprised at how much just a little bit of mulch can help. Uh, and we've done anything from like crushed leaves um, to wood chips, to pine shavings, to, I mean, I mean, there's, there's so many different things that you could use to mulch with. Um, the possibilities are endless. Um, so we do a lot of different, different things. And if you go to your local compost facility, typically they will have like some mulch or wood chips, something along those lines that you can use. Um, and you can put them at the base of your plants and in your, in your gardens, and it'll really help again. Um, the one thing I do want to mention, we typically don't use things like straw or hay, um, because you, you never really know, um, if they're, that hay has been sprayed for herbicide or anything like that. Um, and also with straw, I mean, it'll work, but then you'll have a lot of seeds that come out from that. So you can have a lot of weed issues. So I'm, I typically stick to more like the shredded leaves, the, pine shavings, wood chips, things like that. Um, cause it just, it seems to work really well for us. And then we don't have the issues of having to worry about, um, any herbicide or any weeds coming from it in the future. So again, I wanted to touch a little bit about harvesting and storing of your plants. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about this when we were going through talking about the specific plants, but I wanted to make sure I put them all together and just say in, in general, my favorite way of, of storing is going to be by freezing. It is going to be probably your easiest way. So if you're looking for something fast and easy, just freezing your, your stuff is going to be a lot, a lot, um, a lot easier than the others. Um, but there's definitely other things you can do, um, such as like the drying methods, dehydrating. Um, so having a dehydrator really is great or just simply like hanging things upside down, um, like the, like your herbs, if you hang them upside down and let them dry that way. Um, and then also canning things like making pestos, um, or I have that, um, a recipe right here that I had one year, I made a whole bunch of blackberry jam because I had just like a whole bunch of um, blackberries that I harvested and it was amazing. And I just went through and I made a, a big batch of blackberry jam, which was so good. And so I, uh, I definitely recommend trying that out. Um, but again, I mean, there's so many different ways. I see somebody says that they vacuum pack. That's awesome. Yeah, there's, there's so many different ways to go about storing and preserving your foods. And I highly recommend like doing that as much as possible because then you can have like fresh fruit or fresh, fresh veggies, all of that all throughout the winter time too. So it makes it so worth it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. If anybody else has any other suggestions or ways that they go about doing that, I'd love to hear it. Pop them, pop them in the comment section. And don't forget too, anytime you comment or ask questions too, you're entered to win the giveaway at the end for the one year free premium app subscription. So make sure you're posting. Okay, um, one thing I wanted to touch on too, especially for those in the Southern areas, um, is a little bit about managing heat stress, especially if the temperatures fluctuate really fast. So if like for us, at least we're going from like seventies, eighties, and then suddenly it's going to be like a hundred next week, probably. Um, so we want to make sure that we are protecting things as much as possible. There's several ways to go about doing that and just protecting your plants and also extending the life of your growing season for, some of the cool season plants too. So especially those of you up north, you can grow probably a lot of like those greens and brassicas, things like that um, into the summer by doing a lot of these techniques as well. 
Um, but things that we've done before is by is simply just putting up some shade cloth. So by providing just a little bit of relief from the sun, you can really help, um, especially the afternoon sun, you can really help to go about protecting your plants and just giving them a little bit of break, especially in the afternoon whenever the sun is the most intense. And then I put this picture up here again of the um, cattle panel arch trellis because it's so pretty, but it also is super functional. Um, it can really help to protect the things underneath it from a lot of the harsh conditions. So uh, you would be surprised with the temperature difference between a shady area that's underneath a trellis and from something that's in the full sun. So we've grown um, countless things underneath these trellises that we make and extended our growing season just by simply giving it a little bit of shade um, and growing things like greens or even carrots, radish, um, things like that. Um, we've done a lot of strawberries underneath these and they've, they've done really well. So having any sort of like living shade wall can really help to just extend the growing season for some of your plants, give it some relief from a lot of the heat that's going on and help protect and extend the growing season. Okay, we had a question. So do you clear off the mulch at the end of the season? If so, what do you do with it? So typically, no, I, I let it, I let it stay there and break down and it honestly just turns into more soil. So I just um, re like mix it all in. So whenever I do go about um, like pulling that plant at the end of the season, I'll just mix everything in um, and it all breaks down and gets eaten by the worms and all of that and adds new compost into the soil. So it all works together. So it works really great. Okay, so I think that was the end of all of the stuff that I had planned to talk about. So at this point, I want to make sure um, if anybody has any questions at all, feel free to pop them up into the comment section up here, and you'll be entered to win into the giveaway as well, too. And we will announce that winner here shortly as well. Um, okay, it looks like we have another question. How do you determine how close to plant the companion plant to the main plant? Okay, so that's a great question. So it really, again, depends on what companion plant it is to and what benefit you're trying to get from it. Um, because there are some things that are really great to help like break up the soil, um, like root crops can help really break up the soil. There's like beans and peas, which are great ab about adding nutrients into the soil. Um, so those things you would want to plant like in the same thing, but if it's something that's like helping deter a pest, um, you can just have it next to it in its own pot, things like that. Um, but I, I typically go through and look at the square foot gardening recommendations. And um, that's how we started growing was by going through and following all of those recommendations by how close to plant. And in the app too, you'll see like how close and how many per square that you should be planting. So um, some things it'll be one per square foot, some things it'll be four per square foot. So you can kind of judge to see like how close you can plant things by how big they're gonna get. Um, but yeah, again, it just kind of depends on what type of benefits you're trying to look for, whether you wanna plant it like in that same garden bed or if you can just do a pot next to it. Okay, does the software handle hot zones like 9B. Okay, yeah, so absolutely. So in, in the app, it'll pull up your exact location and it'll pull up your nearest weather station. So it'll pull up what your weather should be. So it'll give you recommendations based on, um, based on the weather from your closest weather station. So it'll go anywhere from all of the different zones. So all the way from up north, down south, east, west, everywhere. So it'll, it'll just, just pull up your closest weather station. Does the app allow you to pick your zone? Um, so it doesn't go off of zone. It only goes off of the local weather station, but you can go through and pick 
your specific location. So if you have um, a specific like zo like area that you want to go to, like you can manually go on the map and click where you want to go. So it doesn't necessarily go by zones because zones are so general um, because like technically I'm in zone seven and the people in like Maryland and way on the East coast are zone seven as well, but we have, we still have very different weather. Um, so just it'll go by location and you can go through and pick your location on a map too. Um, if you, if you don't want to do like your current location, you can go through and pick a different one, stuff like that. Okay, what is the best way to stop things from eating my plants? Well, so the best thing that I could say, not knowing exactly what it is that's eating your plants, um, is simply, I mean, companion planting is going to be like your best friend. You want to make sure to try and hide your plants as, as much as possible. So I, I always recommend things that have like strong scents. So herbs, mints, onions, garlic, things like that are typically really good companion plants. Um, some things do really well together. Some things don't. So make sure you check out um, what are companion plants for the plants that you're worried about. Um, but in the app, if you go in, so if you're struggling with like your tomatoes, um, you can go through and pull up tomatoes and friends and you can look at all the different friends right there and it'll tell you which plants you should plant next to them. Um, so that as well as just encouraging beneficials into your garden. So anything you can do to encourage butterflies, ladybugs, wasps, I know um, all of those are really great at encouraging beneficials. Uh, you want to encourage beneficials as much as possible. So I encourage like herbs, flowers, things like that are going to help bring them in. Um, and then if you're still struggling, there are like organic sprays and things like that that you can use as well. Um, definitely check out my last pest webinar that I did um, two weeks, I think it was two or three weeks ago, um, when I talked more about specific, specific things to do for specific plants and pests and all of that. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it and it was helpful for you. <laughs> okay, are we going to select a winner? Oh, okay, hold on. We have another question about earwigs. Okay, so I did go through and talk a lot about earwigs again at that pest, some, or that pest webinar a couple weeks ago, but long story short, earwigs aren't necessarily bad. Um, unless, I mean, sometimes they can get out of control. They have been, um, they typically only want to eat like, um, almost like rotten stuff or like stuff that has fallen down. Um, but sometimes they can get out of control. A few things you can do is by laying down like newspaper and moistening it at night. And then when you come back in the morning, if you lift it up, you have a bunch of earwigs right underneath it. So it's kind of like making an earwig trap. Um, so that's something that you can do. Um, gosh, I can't remember off the top of my head all of the other ways, but I did have a slide dedicated to just earwigs in that pest in that pest webinar. So make sure you check it out. Um, but that was that was the main thing that stuck out in my head because that always works really well is by just laying down the newspaper and they're just they're always right there. Okay, any cautions using coconut husk in soil? Um, I mean, we use we use coconut core a lot um, as a replacement for peat moss in our garden. So we do we make our own soil for um, we do a mixture of compost and then we do the coconut core and then the vermiculite. Um, coconut core is a really good replacement for peat moss. Um, it doesn't necessarily provide any nutrients into the soil, um, but it does help a lot with um, retaining structure into your soil, um, as well as like holding moisture and things like that. So I, I, I always use coconut core. It works really well for us. Just know that you do need to add in like compost, something like that to bring just a little bit more life into your soil. 
do you use the moon cycle for planting? Okay. So I have actually had this question before many times and we haven't ever done this before. Um, I mean, we've never had any, any, uh, any issues or need to, um, we've always just gone by the dates and looked at the weather and I'm sure it all kind of lines up together too. Um, but I would be curious to see if you have and how it has worked for you. Um, cause it's, it's just, it's not something that we have ever really looked at doing. Okay. What about hot areas? Plants frequently says full sun, but does this really apply to somewhere as hot as Arizona? Okay. So yeah, I, I will say in whenever it says full sun, this is going to be about like six to eight hours of sun, um, especially in a hot area like that. So you want to make sure that you just provide it with enough sun for it to thrive. And that's just fine. Um, yeah, six to eight hours is that. Oh, we have a winner, looks like. <laughs> um, okay, congratulations, Patricia Perez. Email us at info at seedtospoon.net and we will get you set up for um, for the one year free premium app subscription, which will be great. So you can go through, you can log all your plants, you can get all sorts of um, questions from the robot up there. So again, if I didn't get a chance to answer all of the uh, questions that you guys had, or if you're watching this after the fact, make sure you go into the app and go down to Growbot and ask Growbot any of your questions and Growbot will help out too. Um, you can also feel free to post any sort of questions that you have here in the comments, and I will get back to you as soon as I can as well, and possibly even make another video about it. So <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us today. It was great. Um, we typically do these every couple weeks, and so make sure that you stay tuned. And if you're not already following us and subscribe to our channel, make sure that you do that now. So that way you can be notified when we go live next and join us next time. Thank you so much, everybody for joining. It was great to see you and hang out.